G'day you mob, Pete here, and this is another episode of Aussie English, the number one place for anyone and everyone wanting to learn Australian English. So, today I have a GOSS episode for you where I sit down with my old man, my father, Ian Smithson, and we talk about the week's news, whether locally down under here in Australia or (laughs) non-locally overseas in other parts of the world, okay? And we sometimes also talk about whatever comes to mind, right? If we can think of something interesting to share with you guys related to us or Australia, we also talk about that in the GOSS. So, these episodes are specifically designed to try and give you content about many different topics where we're obviously speaking in English and there are multiple people having a natural and spontaneous conversation in English. So, it is particularly good to improve your listening skills. In order to complement that though, I really recommend that you join the podcast membership or the academy membership at aussieenglish.com.au where you will get access to the full transcripts of these episodes, the PDFs, the downloads, and you can also use the online PDF reader to read and listen at the same time, okay? So, if you really, really want to improve your listening skills fast, Get the transcript, listen and read at the same time, keep practicing, and that is the quickest way to level up your English. Anyway, I've been rabbiting on a bit. I've been talking a bit. Let's just get into this episode, guys. Smack the bird and let's get into it. What's going on, Dad? Hey, Pete. Man, I'm- Hey, before we get on to anything else- Coming Australian. Nice. There we go. Hold it up. The family. If I, if I hold it up. Is there a photo of this. me on the front? It just disappears. No, you're not. You didn't make the front cover. You so. bastard. Do you want me to hang on? I have to find you <laughs> and see when you, you did make a picture. You made something somewhere. You might want to um mention what this is that you're holding up for the I, people I who will. can't see. I will. Yeah, here we go. This is, we're going to put you in front of me. You're going to have to hold it up higher, I think, Dad. I can't hold it up too much because if I hold it up there, it disappears. There you go. There's Pete as a baby. That does two days not old. look like me. No. Um, Far this out. Is I my... had a lot of hair. You I did. You realize. looked like uh, my mother decided that your father was Chinese for a while because you had this big <laughs> swathe of black hair. Yeah. Um, yes. Family history book just finished. Yay. Far published. Out. Yeah, do you want to give that a, a spiel? Maybe um, just talk about what it is and why you decided to. What um, it is and why I decided it. to do it. Yeah, well, it was sort of a. Um, I got interested in our family history when um, I was probably in my early twenties, just from a general interest of you know my grandfather lived with us, and just talking to him about you know old family stories and things because he was the only grandparent that I really knew. My his wife, my mother's mother. Uh, died when I was before I was two years old, and my father's parents um, lived in England. Never met them, and in fact, my father was sort of um, he never spoke to them after the, after about nineteen fifty. So um, I never knew them at all. Um, so the only grandfather I knew was the one who lived with us for the last twelve years or so of his life, and so I sort of got interested in family history then. And then my father died uh, when I was twenty five. Um, and my mother died when I was 40 and I looked at it and went, but I'd start recording some of these stories. My grandchildren, who at the time didn't exist, but now I've got four, um, will never know anything. So I just you know, got interested in family history, started collecting things and this huge database of information, uh, which is completely unintelligible to anybody else. Um, I decided I'd put it together and write, a, write the book about you know, my family history. So it's really a a letter to you and your sister and your children um, of this is where I came from. So it's a tough one, isn't it? When you write a book and you've got a target audience of two. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, six, um, but it's the same audience. I mean, obviously, I've got you know, yeah. Well, I sisters. had two and a half sisters, um, but two sisters who have the same ancestry and their children as well. So it is as relevant to your cousins, um, not that they have children yet, but yeah, you know, and their children in the future. So. I'm only I'm only going to get 25 copies run off to start with, mm-hmm. um, and you know that'll probably be enough. Um, I decided in the end that while I say published, it is self-published and printed and so on. But um, I decided in the end not to record uh, an ISBN, uh, which would mean that it yeah you know, a copy would have to go to the National Library and the State Library of Victoria um, uh, because it contains a lot of 
personal information um, and it contains chapters written by my two sisters as well. And I didn't get their permission to do that. So, yeah. Um, yeah. so that was, that's the really, you know, the only you know, distinction really between publishing and you know, producing multiple copies of the book. So there's no way so for the audience cousins to get, a, will get them. I was going to say, you should um, sprinkle to the audience, but take it that you're not selling these. <laughs> I'm, no, I'm saying. not. I'm not. Yeah, yeah you want for $100, $100 <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is about what it will cost to print and post. Good so, God. Uh, well, when you're doing a print run of 25, yeah. they cost yeah. 70 plus dollars each. If I did a print run of a thousand, they'd probably cost me $30 each. So, yeah. um, <laughs> but it'd be 30 grand. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. exactly. So, looking back, was it worth doing? Oh, well, ultimately, the test will be you and your um, sister and your children. I'm not going to read it. I've got stuff no, to I know. do, Dad. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I'm just going to flick through so, and look at the pictures. And look, the other thing, too, was it was a um, it was a lockdown project when you know, I sort of started thinking about it at the beginning of last year. Yeah. And then when we went into lockdown in February, I thought, oh, well, I might as well just start putting this together. And um, yeah, then one thing led to another. And um, yeah, it's finally come to fruition, which was sort of, it was fun. Um, as much as anything else, it was fun just to look at the um, the holes and try and make a complete story, complete in a sense of um, what do I know and what do I not know um, and what holes do I need to fill and finding out a bit more information about my aunt and uncle and stuff to, uh, to fill up a chapter on them uh, was interesting and getting back in contact with a couple of cousins that I haven't spoken to for years uh, was, was fun as well. So. How do you know when it's done? That, well, your family history is never ask. done because no, the definition. Book, I guess. The, the, the well, book, how do you know when to say that's enough? Because it's, yeah. it's a diminishing curve. Of course it is. Returns curve, right? Like learning a language where, I, I mean, learning a language you're never done because it's not sort of a finalised product that yeah. you have at the end of the day, except for maybe on your deathbed. But, um, you know, with like an album that you're creating, you know, a musical album, it's always one of those things that people talk about where it's like, how do you, how did you know when it was finished? When, so that when is you? good enough enough? Yeah, yeah. it is. Um, although with this one, it started off with, well, I'll just write me. I'll just write my story. Ironically, that was one of the last ones that I ended up doing um, because I thought, well, if I'm going to do me, then, and I asked my two sisters uh, if they would write theirs. To, I thought you were um, going to say to write part of yours. <laughs> yeah, to write, no, but to write the equivalent yeah. so that, yeah, because they're as much a part of my family and I can talk about what I think of them, but, mm -hmm. you know, for them to talk about their experiences. Because um, as much as anything else, it's about answering the questions. And I think I wrote it in the introduction um, that it was about answering the questions for my grandchildren that I never got to ask my grandparents. Um, so the unasked questions for in, the, in both cases. Mm. So, um, so it was an interesting way of doing that. And then it was going back and looking at it and going, well, how much is you know, enough? Uh, but you're right in terms of well, when you've compiled all of this, uh, and there's a lot of you know, it's 350 pages um, and a lot of photographs. So you know, photographs of people and places and so on, um, and that's compiling that. And then you get to the point of saying, well, I've, I'm I've done enough research and collation, um, then it's finalising the writing. The most difficult part for me, because I wasn't producing this as a commercial product, um, I decided I didn't want to send it to an editor who would have charged me thousands of dollars to do a final edit on mm. the book. Um, of doing the editing yourself, it's really difficult to edit your own work. Uh, and so I was finding that I could only do about 10 pages at a time of doing those final edits and I did it three times and I will guarantee you there are still errors in it, um, mm. but it's that diminishing returns. The last time, the last run through, the third sort of proofread that I did of it, I picked up about five errors and I went, there were 500 errors in the first run through. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, if I did it again, I might pick up one. It doesn't mean there's only one there, but yeah. you just get immune to seeing your own flaws. Well, you so see it so often too. You know, oh, you know you what it says, it so you closely. don't read it. That always happened to support. me with writing scientific papers. Yeah. There would always be massive issues if I handed it to someone else, but after I'd read it 10 times, I was like, I'm not seeing yeah, what other you people Yeah, you seeing. don't actually read it. Yeah. And that I was just the thing know is, what's there in each I section. I had to force myself to literally read it word for word, yeah. and one of the things that I found is that you read it out loud mm -hmm. um, because that means you are reading every word, whereas if you just... I uh, Particularly scanning. doing this as you, know, you, you just you end up scanning it. No, stop it. I actually want to check for every spelling error. And yes, I can do a spell check, 
but a spell check doesn't take detect context yeah yeah the word might be spelt correctly but it's just the wrong word to put there yeah <laughs> and so on so uh, yeah but it was fun um hopefully you get something out of it and you stick it on a shelf and never look at it again but yeah you know, oh well it's always good to have i can imagine this is one of those things that's interesting to talk about you can probably give some pointers to the listeners here but i'm, I'm always chatting to kel about her family history because i can imagine that yeah. it just shits all over mine no offense but you know hey She's got- your, your mother's when book two will come out if I ever get your mother to start writing hers, uh, because she's got some really interesting stuff. Because you know, yeah, you're related to you know, European royalty, yeah, you know, twenty generations ago. Um, yeah, the old gag about people say they you know, their ancestors came over with William the Conqueror when they came to England. Well, mm. William the Conqueror was your ancestor. Um, so, but we anyway, did an episode right. on that. But yeah, Kel- yeah, Kells is much more diverse. Well, she um, she did so- a DNA test and found out that she's. She's got at least five sub-Saharan African countries, I think, that, that <laughs> yeah. you know, lineages that she's come from. So mm. uh, I, I would imagine that, that that's the potential then for five, at least five people in her history who were brought over to Brazil as slaves from five different countries. There's probably many yeah. more than five people that led into her, you know, biologically, like her family is, is yes. part, partly from five different places in Africa. And then I think she has, yeah. you know, indigenous and she's native South, South American, American indigenous yeah, South American. And then a and... shitload of European from all over yeah. the place, France, Spain, Portugal, Ireland. Yeah. And it's just one of these things where I'm like, my God, you should really try and dive in and learn a bit more about your, your history. Cause it's probably, you know, you think it's boring and it's probably boring for the first few generations, yes. but if you can get back into the meat of it, um, to when people first started coming to Brazil and learn about why they decided to come to Brazil or, mm. or you know, why they were forced to come to Brazil. Yeah, well- They're going to be the interesting stories. That's what I call this book, as you can see, Becoming Australian. Yeah. Uh, because for me, um, and I, I make the point in the introduction that because obviously Kel has migrated to Australia um, and even though your mother is Australian because both her parents are Australian, she was born in England- um, and so you go through that and your children are first, second, third, fourth, sixth, seventh and eighth generation Australians. Mm. There's only one generation in those eight that have come to Australia that is missing in terms of you know, that generation either was born in Australia or never arrived in Australia. Um, and so it's the migration stories as to how and why and when and where did people come um, is the really interesting part. And where did they come from is equally interesting, but it's almost that um you know i became an australian because my father came here my great grandparents came here great 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 and so on all came here for various reasons at different times and looking at you know where they came from and why they came is an interesting thing to do so yeah so what pointers would you have for people who are listening to this i mean are there sort of broad tips that you could give people who don't necessarily have um What's it called? The the system that we have for, you know, Christian births, deaths, and marriages that has held a lot of our information over generations. Um, oh, Parishes, well, right? Parish documents. Yeah. Well, there's church, there's church records, yeah. and then there are the civil records as well. Yeah. Um, so obviously in Australia, we've been recording. You know, civil registration started very early in a context. Yeah, within decades of Australia. You know. You know or at least New South Wales becoming a colony. Um, And in many European countries, it was sort of early to the middle 19th century that civil registration, that is the government, were recording births, deaths, marriages. But before that, it was the church. And in fact, where if you're um, English, we have a huge advantage over many others uh, in Europe because the Catholic Church never gave a shit about recording births, deaths and marriages. Um, yeah, there might be a few that were recorded, but they didn't do it as systematically. Yeah. Whereas the Church of England, when it was created, did it systematically because they wanted to prove that these people were not Catholic because uh, the Church of England split off from the Catholic Church. Yeah. They, it was important to them to demonstrate that, yes, you were born, you were baptised. You know, nobody recorded births, but you were baptised in the Church of England. You were married in the Church of England. You were buried in a Church of England graveyard. Those were important things to be recorded to prove that you were not Catholic. And so, yeah, the whole England, go, you know, going back to the middle of the 16th century when the Church of England was created, the parish records are a huge 
uh, thing, which is not the case in many other European countries. It's it's much more difficult to trace your ancestry back past civil registration. Um, in the case of, and I've had many discussions with people, and I've even had some reasonably close relatives um, say, oh, you know, we came over with you know, William the Conqueror, that old gag. Yeah. Um, and I said, how do you know? Because mm -hmm. unless you are related to the aristocracy, none of that was recorded before the creation of the Church of England in Britain. Um, Scotland were very good as well at recording a lot of those things because the, the Scottish Church, ironically, Scotland was as important to say we're not part of the <laughs> Church of England, um, yeah. and, their, and their Catholic churches were recording things very well. So, um, yeah, that was the, the sort of reverse psychology in Scotland. Um, but in order to demonstrate that you have older heritage than that, and you know, if you before the middle of the 16th century, the only people who recorded that were the aristocracy and royalty, because for them, yep. inheritance of property and property marrying other property, families marrying other families, it was important to document. Um, so, you know, you can, where well, your mother has, you can trace your ancestry back 30 generations because yeah. you have one connection with the aristocracy, which then goes into royalty. Um, and that becomes extremely incestuous. You get that one line and then all of a sudden you're related to every royal family in Europe well, and the, because they all intermarry. The ironic thing is we probably all can make our way back into aristocracy somehow. It's just whether or not you can actually find... Yeah, although I, I, everything I know about my ancestry would suggest that, no, we were just, you know, agricultural labourers, <laughs> shit kickers and, you know, fishermen, filth. agricultural labourers. Yeah. Not filth. You know, <laughs> Surfs. <laughs> Doing the good service work and, and you know, domestic servants and so on. So, yeah, yes, most people would probably have some relationship back some, you know, somewhere, but there is also that thing that, you know, the vast majority of people have never been related to the aristocracy. They were the serfs, you know, they were the, you know, the, the scum out doing the, the hard work. It is yeah. funny, though. I think we were, I was looking this up and it's like, if you go back 35 generations and, you know, assuming all your relatives are from the same location right so the same country you yeah. you are effectively as equally related to every single person in that population yes right? It's, right? It's, statistically speaking yeah, like genetically because... speaking the amount of genetics that would be in you say from mm -hmm. so mum traced back to william the conqueror and i think went to i am Charlemagne. many generations before that yeah, yeah so, so the, the, once you get back there it's like yeah we have one line there but if you were to pick any other average person up out of france or england at that yes. time they would probably be equally related to me yeah, of course because it, to... it's actually it's actually a, a diamond shape in terms of relationships yeah because yeah you know, the gag is that you've got twice as many relatives as i have and noah has um, got twice as many as and noah has got twice yeah. as many as you and so on yeah um but that only works as you say you know, as you go back so many generations but when you get back to the point of you multiply you know well i can't do it in my head but two to the power 20 is a huge number yeah and it is probably beyond the population of britain at that time yeah. And so, therefore, you're related to every person that ever existed in Britain, as an example. Uh, and so. Yeah, that's uh, two to the power of 20 is 1,048,576. Yeah. So, yeah. so it would have been about that many people, you, right? In, in, yeah, in but England. you go back another four generations, say, yeah. which is only yeah, 100 years, just over 100 years, yeah. then you've suddenly got 16, you know, 16 million, 16 million yeah. which is more than the population of Britain at the time, not yeah. just England, but Britain. And we're only talking about the British components of us. But, yes, you can then say, oh, we go to Europe and blah, blah, blah. But you end up getting to the point where the population of the world uh, is smaller than the number of relatives, notional relatives you have. So those notional relatives have got to start to double and triple and quadruple up yeah. is that you get these multiple things. And that's the same yeah, when your mother was doing this uh, research into the royal families and relationships to royal families. It all comes through one person. Yeah. Um, and it all goes back to a small number of people in the end, but all you're looking at is the royals. Um, and so, yeah, it's a yeah, you're hit your in the grander scheme of things when you go back thousands of years, it's a diamond shaped ancestral tree because we always think of ancestral trees as just constantly expanding upwards, but it doesn't work that way. Well, yeah. It is interesting when you see those sorts of TV shows and they go back in time and see one ancestor and you kind of like, if you just look around, everyone's your ancestor, you know, like yeah. you, well, you went yeah. back to, 
you know, you know, a thousand years ago or whatever, and you start looking around, you're like, this was my great, 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 great grandfather. And you're like, yeah, but you yes. could probably point at any other man here in this movie <laughs> yeah, yeah. and it would be the same story, right? Like, yeah, probably. Especially if he's from yeah. the same town. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, and look, in the end, I, for me, I only go back five generations in this, and that's because I can document, apart from one person, I can document all of the other you know, people in that generation um, legitimately. The one I have that is questionable, I'm 99% sure it is the right person, but I've got no absolute documentary proof yeah. that it is. Um, and, and that's one of the challenges that you have is that the further back you go, the less uh, information you have and the less reliable the information that you do have is. Um, so uh, I haven't bothered to try it. And there are some where I can go back 11 generations uh, but it's pointless for me to do that yeah, and try and talk about them because, yes, I know this person was born and they had a child. That's it. Yeah, that's, yeah. And so who cares about that? So what I've tried to do in the book is to talk about, you know, say my great-grandparents or great-great-grandparents is ooh, where were they born? What did they do? How did they get together? What did their children do? Uh, rather than just, you know, do this giant family tree with you know, a whole lot of branches of just dates and places on it have have you heard of the tv show omniscient from brazil you probably haven't um, no but it, no. I, I tend not to try and keep up with brazilian television but, yeah. <laughs> not that yeah. i do not i try not to i just don't there'll do probably it. be a shitload of brazilian listeners so many right now like maybe you know, of course three there listening yes. and being like i love that show um yes. so this show yeah. is effectively they're living in a society where 24 7 um there's a surveillance drone a small little mosquito looking drone that follows the person around <laughs> and watches them and so it's effectively right. eradicated crime but the premise of the whole show is that someone gets obviously murdered and because the drone footage didn't see that murder or didn't didn't um identify it as a crime it's not a murder and yes. so they have to unwind that but i was thinking i'm, I'm mentioning this for a reason but i kind of jumped ahead to this because i just looked it up um it does it blow your mind how if we go back to your generation or even your parents' generation, you know, like if your parents were still here prior to, say, the 90s, the sum total of evidence of their existence in this planet, on this planet, in this world, could have probably fit in a briefcase, right, in terms of photos yeah. or documents. Yeah. Yep. And, I mean, volume-wise, the sum total of my evidence can probably fit on this device right here. Yes. I'm holding in front of my face, my phone. Yeah. But does it blow your mind today that so much of Noah's life, for example, is documented now from the beginning and mm -hmm. just how much when he's my age, he's probably going to have access to some kind of digital library of his life effectively yeah. where he'll be able to flick through probably almost to a daily basis, you know, probably there'll probably be gaps. There, but the question, the question is going to be, who who is going to curate the, this stuff? Not just for Noah, yeah. but for millions of children in the world who are living in a socioeconomic situation that enables them to a have access to the technology now, and b have access to the technology in the future that will be able to collect it and collate it and so on. Uh, who's going to be curating that stuff to the point where Noah is ever going to want to, and I'm using Noah as the example, but ever going to be even capable of going back and going, um, show me what I was doing on the 15th of August in 2024. Well, I imagine, uh, though, it would probably be a similar thing to Facebook, of the Facebook memories, how they just yeah. randomly show you shit that happened on this day yeah. from you know yeah, last exactly. year, two years ago, 10 years ago where you could just get on this database and it'll be like, here's what you were doing four years ago or here's what you were yes. doing, you know, in two. But that's, but that's my point is whatever. that Facebook is curated. Yeah. Um, Facebook is a database. It'd be digital, that, right? Yeah. Yeah. But when I when you upload something to Facebook or Instagram or any of the other social media or the web in general, there's a, yeah, there's a date and time stamp, a location stamp, and that sort of stuff, you know, who posted it. So that's relevant. But at the moment, most of that digital information about Noah, as an example, sits on your phone. Yeah. It might sit on your computer or some of it. Where is it going to end up to the point where Noah can actually get access to it? Well, I would imagine <laughs> it would eventually just get connected to the cloud, right? And the cloud would be through a website where you could just go. 
Who yeah, knows? but Who you knows? dump you dump a terabyte of information up there, and then how does that get? Yeah, tagged, curated, that sort of stuff. And I, I, it's it'll all be there. And you're right; it is very different. I don't think about my childhood. You know, everything that I know about me, or everything that you could know about me, other than asking me, um, would sit in a shoebox. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so a couple of photo albums and a few documents. Um, and well, and you it's know, not you much could... different from me as well, right? I, no. I, the first, I, I mean, I don't think you've got video of you as a child, right? No. And the, no. The, I think the first video I have is when we went to Fraser Island and my Uncle Paul had a video camera there with him, right? So yeah. it would be like 13, 12, 13. Yeah, that's 2000. That. So, yeah. Whereas Noah has video of him effectively at least every week, I would imagine, from the day he was born. You know, and so I guess that was my point. It blows my mind how quickly this has changed, but also how, you know, what what, what's it going to be like in the future? Are we going to end up with these drones that just follow us around and record every (laughs) single moment of every single day that you could potentially, whether or not it's used for crime or whatever, you could just look up, you know, it's just nuts. And it's always one of those things. The reason I guess I mentioned this is because it is, you see these things about your ancestors, right? Like in your book and you think, Mm -hmm. fuck, this person... All that's left of this person is a handful of documents and maybe a photo or two, if they're, especially yeah. if they're from the 1800s. And that wasn't that long ago. Yeah. And yet they lived an entire life, right? Like you find exactly. out they died at the age of 80 or whatever. And you're like, I'm not even 35 and I have shitloads of photos and videos and stories. And there's a, you mm-hmm. know, I'm a, I'm a person. I have all this history behind me. But it's, it's almost tragic that there are so many people that you would just never know anything about and that nothing of them remains effectively yeah but also is this is not just incidental stuff too that you know somebody in your circumstance is a good example of you know i could drop dead tomorrow and your children could go back in two five ten years and look at a hundred episodes of the goss and go dad just talking shit this is what my dad and his dad were talking about yeah yeah this is so there is a not just a record that says they existed and they lived here and they did this job, but yeah. there is just yeah, it's it's living data. Well, and I think uh, that's, that's 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 the deeper thing to it. I would love to be able to consume content like the Goss, even mm-hmm. if it was a handful of episodes of your father speaking or even your mother speaking, or yeah. let, let alone your other ancestors, to really know about just to to get a glimpse of what their days were like, what they were worried about, what they found interesting, um, their facial expressions, you know, what turned them Mm. on, what did they think of wildlife, of politics, of those sorts of things. So, it is is one of those things where I'm I'm glad that my son will have access to this content for me and you, Mm. but it, it, it is this tragedy that I've always sort of thought about with ancestors, you know, it's just like all you have are your memories. And imagine what it was like, you know, in the 1800s or prior to the camera being made where you didn't even have photos, right? Someone no, died exactly. and that was yeah. all you may have had was a possession that they had. Unless at one you were point. rich and famous, you had a painting and that yeah. was it. But- and even then that doesn't necessarily represent what the person actually looked like 100%. No. No, so exactly. it is. It is a really interesting. I don't know, kind of thought. But yeah, I'm always on the yeah. side of. Um, it's really unfortunate that we don't have more. Yeah, no, I agree. And that's funnily enough, that was part of the. You know, was the major part of the motivation for me writing this book. As if I don't, uh, and not just talking about me, but you know, because hopefully I'm around long enough for your children to actually ask me some of the things they might want to know. Um, just keep getting more, that prostate check, Dad. You'll be yeah, fine. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it was more, you know my parents and grandparents and so on of writing what I know about them and what I can document. Um, because without doing that, nobody, there's stuff in here that nobody else knows because the conversations that I had with my yeah. parents or there's documentation that I've collected and can put a story together around how they met as an example. And, you know, and so if I don't record that, it's gone. Do you, um, do you ever so feel, that was the motivation. Do you ever feel like it that that tragedy of, oh, my grandfather was such a cool... Pete, you would have loved this guy. And you're kind of like, it's just such a shame yeah. that we can't reach across the generations and get these two people to sit down and chat to one another. You're like, it's... It, geologically speaking, it's such a short amount of time. But mm. at the same time, it's a insurmountable barrier. There was yeah. just no way yeah. that you were ever going to be able to communicate with your great-great-great-grandfather no, but exactly. there are people that were in the middle that knew both of you, right? Like my yes. grandfather knows his grandfather, would have met his grandparents, 
but yeah, they exactly. would have been born in the mid 1800s right so yeah, yeah. It, it is just it's one of these things where i'm like it, it's so funny all humans have there's no real difference right throughout the most recent 10 20 100 generations we were all effectively the same personality the same sort of people we are today there was no you know we used to have three legs and you know hate, <laughs> hated honey you know but yeah. the, but you just never have the chance like imagine how cool it would have been to have understood what julius caesar was going through right like you yeah. know, before he was murdered you know because exactly. <laughs> he was just a human being like everyone else yeah. so i always have those kinds of thoughts and i'm just like ah fuck you know it would have been so good to to have some kind of connection with so many people even from only 100 years ago yeah well it's that i mean you, you remember when um yeah facebook and yeah myspace for want of a bit you know, yeah <laughs> remember that uh, when they first came out and these sort of what we would now call memes but today's version of what a meme is is actually not what the original thing was but these memes going around of as in behavioural memes of, you know, here's 20 questions, introduce yourself. And, mm -hmm. you know, one of those questions is often, who would you like to meet? Yeah. And I always used to partly facetiously, but, you know, partly in reality, say my great-great-grandchildren. Yeah. So um, you'd go forward, you wouldn't go backwards. Yeah, well, yeah, but the same thing. It works the same way that, you know, I would like to go back and talk to my great-grandparents or great-great-grandparents, but I would also like to be able to meet, and not just because I want to live till I'm 150, but mm -hmm. I would also like to meet my great-great-grandchildren to just to see what their life is like. <laughs> yeah, what problems yeah. have you guys got? <laughs> I don't need to live that long, but I'd like to you know, jump forward 100 years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you got flying cars yet? Yeah, exactly. I think yeah. I would probably go forward if I could choose. As opposed yeah. to backwards. And I think that's probably because we understand what's happened in the past, right? We have a somewhat of an idea of, of what people have gone through and what people had, didn't have, their struggles. But the yes. future is still yet to be written. And so... Yeah, to me, the, the going backwards, I would much rather go back and... Yeah, yes, I would like to have met my father's father, um, but only because I didn't. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> and so... Yeah, but that's it. You it, did end up being a, a short convo and you're like, this guy's a dickhead. Like, yeah, well, he was a <laughs> he was a congregational minister, a yeah. minister in the congregational church. So, I think we would have had some fundamental differences in well, our you, view of the world. You would have either had a lot to talk about or very little to talk about. Yeah, but I think we also had a lot in common. Yeah. And you can read the chapter on him to decide whether you think that's true or not. Uh, but... I would much rather go back and talk to famous people in the past. You know, you mentioned Julius Caesar. You know, the mm -hmm. one person, if you would ask me, who would I like to go back and interview was Charles Darwin. You know, you know, I would, that would be one of the great things in life to go back and just interview your um, scientific hero. You know, I, I, it wouldn't be that. I'd be, it'd be a QA. and a I'd be like, ask me anything, dude. Yeah. <laughs> what do you want to know like about, oh, yeah, yeah. about everything that's happened since you died you know like yeah. I'll, i'm happy to answer your questions all right it's like who, which which hero would you have that would you you would allow to interview you yes because <laughs> i'm sure he would have a lot more questions for me than i would for oh him. i'm sure he would yeah. <laughs> anyway this is probably a long enough episode dad um, all right yeah we didn't get to the news so we can do that in the next one we didn't <laughs> see you guys <laughs> bye Alrighty, you mob, thank you so much for listening to or watching this episode of The Goss. If you would like to watch the video, if you're currently listening to it and not watching it, you can do so on the Aussie English channel on YouTube. You'll be able to subscribe to that. Just search Aussie English on YouTube. And if you're watching this and not listening to it, you can check this episode out also on the Aussie English podcast, which you can find via my free Aussie English podcast application on both Android and iPhone. You can download that for free or you can find it via any other good podcast uh, app that you've got on your phone, Spotify, podcast from iTunes, Stitcher, whatever it is. I'm your host, Pete. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you have a ripper of a day and I will see you next time. Peace.